Hi, this is Erica, and I'm going to be doing a full set of full cover soft gel tips gel X system. Um, I personally cannot use acrylic, um, so I also don't like the way that how my nails grow upwards and how it makes the acrylic um, look on me anyhow. So with um, the full coverage soft gel tips, it seems to have a better way of laying on my nail bed. Plus I have a really short nail bed. So I prefer this product. The nail prep for this product is just like any other artificial nail. Um, you still have to keep any type of moisture away from the nail bed in order to get no lifting and um, there's lots of tips on how to prep these soft gel to have the best adhesion to your nail bed so um, some people like to size these before you know um, they some people like to size these after they prep but I don't want them to get any dust and my nails seem to my hands seem to sweat more so I like to size them before I do my nail prep I sterilize my hands with alcohol and I'm gonna be doing the extra short round size gel X has different sizes and they have it usually comes in a case like this and the nail tips are in there like this but and they also have um, primer they also have bonder and the gel extend gel which is kind of like if you ever had a press on nail this is like the glue but this product actually lasts up to two weeks or more on your fingers and it's just great I love it and you cure it with a light I actually have a flash cure lamp you do a flash cure then you go ahead and do a full cure on your hand lamp so in any case this is my flash cure and I like to put it on something to hold it so that I can kind of move it around my desk. I'm looking for a plastic thing that I typically use for it. One second. Otherwise, look, it just clamps right here at the end of any table and you can when you're doing the nails you can do a flash cure which I'm gonna demonstrate all of that we're gonna go ahead and clamp this on the table and yeah basically whenever I'm putting the fake nail I'll just excuse me Sorry, I'm having a little lighting problem here. But whenever I do the flash cure, I'm just going to go ahead and put the nail here and boom. It's going to be awesome. I cannot wait. Oh, look, my light came back on. Awesome. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get started with my Gel X. You're not going to see me. I'm going to be focused on my work area. We're going to do what they call the dry prep. Dry prep with no um, dipping my hand in a bowl. Um, this prevents, of course, moisture and lifting. And I'm also going to be doing a dry prep with no drill. 
The only thing I'm actually going to be using this drill for is to be prepping my nails that I'm going to be putting on my fingers. Because you do have to prep them, but just so you know, you don't even have to use this. You can use um, any... I'll show you here. You could either use a file... I mean, a cuticle thing that has a file at the end. But you have to get the fake nail and you have to rough it up before you put it on your fingernail. So anyway, I'm just going to do this dry prep. Okay, guys. Excuse my dog. You can hear him over there having fun. All right. So we're going to size these babies and I'll be right back with you. Okay, so I've gone ahead and sized all of my tips, which are right here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and start my dry manicure now. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start by pushing back my cuticles. And then I'm going to go ahead and sterilize my cuticle nipper, cuticle pusher. In 1935 issue of Flight Magazine describes the scene of flight attendants just running through a cabin with thinly made paper mache buckets for all the sick looking passengers. Frequent air sickness among passengers. And I'm doing this gently, even if it looks like I'm pushing hard, I'm not. In 1949, Gilmore Sheldon walks through the doors at Northwest Airlines corporate office. He's there to sell them on an improved method of storing liquid and food over long travel periods. Sheldon had designed and patented a heat stable bag that had a thermoplastic interior lining, and that lining protected the contents from any temperature changes. But more importantly, because it had a plastic lining, it was leak free. Northwest saw a different potential for the technology, using the bags for people to vomit into. I mean, imagine being the first person to come up with something so simple. It's like the lunchbox. I need to take the food to school. Why don't we put all that in one box? And we'll call it lunchbox. Look at this. It's, it's such a nice way to vomit. Being like you're going to lose your cookies at altitude, grab one of these. Empty the contents of your stomach into the air sickness bag. Oh, all good. I never had to pop it this way to anybody. Just now, want to make sure I have my steps proper here. Use a bag in every seat is a lot of money. So with just a hundred dollars, he started a company making bark bags. Imagine being a company that's like, all right, we're here to talk to you about bark, and we have a bag for you. Soon, things began taking off for the inventor, and it wasn't long before his bark bags were tucked into the seat back of every Northwest flight in America. My biggest problem with this is the size. This is just like a warm-up. You better throw up like this much. That bag is only so big. This is more like a, a puke pouch. As the airline industry expanded, so did the bag industry. Every pocket of every seat on every airplane had a bark bag. Thanks to the success of the bark bag, Shalal's company branched out, manufacturing other amazing products like high altitude research balloons and protective plastic doors to keep submarines from flooding when a torpedo is launched. Oh, and they're the brains behind the laminating process we still use to this day. Today, air travel isn't just safer, it's also smoother. Modern airlines have moved away from shell oils, really heavy duty bags, and replaced them with a cheaper paper cushion. The bark bag still lives on. I don't feel like picking anymore. That's no fun. Just my cuticles my back. I don't trust the power and strength. And I'm gonna go oh, ahead and once you're on it, you can't continue to trim. Like, I'm scared I'll my nails. I'm 
I'm going to be using my OPI. And this is a 180 grit. This is a 100 grit. Actually, this one is from McCart as well. It's really good for buffing. And Young Nails, that one's always good as well. So. But this has like a nice um, file that's not too sharp. I'm just going to go ahead and shape them square and continue to trim my cuticles back as well and shape these nails. Following the nail growth line. really gently. I have really fragile thin nails. This is what kind of brought me into wanting to do nails. I just never been able to have beautiful nails. Even with acrylic, um, you have to be very gentle with my nail prep. And it's just been a journey for me. So I decided to get into it myself. And here I am. I've always been interested in nails, doing nails, and I think I never had pretty nails. I wanted them all. So he reverted to the simplest name ever, the waterbed. Health benefits are not, the waterbed made a splash. In 1986, waterbeds made up one-fifth of all bed sales and accounted for a billion dollars. The only thing louder than the demand? With the commercials. Every bed slinger in town knows the bed has the best selection, the lowest prices, and the most experience. You don't have to wait until after Christmas to say. Right now, it's Superior Waterman every day. So every month, Superior Waterman has the greatest selection and the greatest prices all the time. Then I can't have a waterman. Then I can't have a waterman. Okay, Kim, you can have a waterman. Daddy loves you. Buyers were thrilled about their purchases. But that wasn't necessarily the case when they got their beds home. They would spring a leak, they would be a flood in the apartment. Well, you couldn't have them in your apartment. They just became a mess. Inadvertent punctures and cracking on the fold lines spelled disaster. News began to spread that water beds were a potential liability. Suddenly, demand for the water bed had completely dried up. I mean, do they still make water beds? Actually, they do. And just recently, Charles reinvented his creation and gave it a new name as well. The Afloat. Is it really better on the waterbed? Oh, absolutely. The time may have come in. It is the most comfortable one anybody saw. It's better than the original one because it has no swashy stuff. One thing is undeniable. As far as American innovators go, Charles has earned his place alongside the very best of them. My girlfriend and I had a waterbed for a while, but then we drifted apart. Eventually our whole relationship okay. was finally, and 
I do, I'm gonna go ahead and take all the dust off, come back and work on my cuticles with my nippers. I do always like to sterilize. I have very sensitive fingers and also helps keep the oil. So this is just alcohol. That's why we're telling the stories behind mankind's most incredible. I don't really have a lot of cuticle to remove. The insanely brilliant, what do they do? The flat out insane. I'm still recording. You are going to hear a lot of silence throughout my videos. This is for my licensing, so I'm fulfilling my hours and requirements in real time. I really love these nippers. They're really doing a good job of getting what I need them to get. Mr. Potato Head became an instant smash hit and was the first toy to have its own commercial. You can make the funniest looking people in the whole world. It sold millions in its first year and even spawned Mrs. Potato Head, released on Valentine's Day in 1953. And there's a car shopping sale for his wife, Mrs. Potato Head. It's been fun to do and so easy. For more than a decade, children across the globe were raiding their parents' pantries to play potato dressing. But Mr. Potato had success. 
process drew sudden attention to the concept's fatal flaw. Parents were finding moldy, rotten potatoes in every crevice of their home. And negative word of mouth led to the hot potato sales going cold. Lost potatoes would sprout and rot in the houses of Americans. It sounds like a metaphor for communism. So in 1964, Hasbro introduced the plastic potato. Yeah, I remember this one. It's when you put all the parts in the butt. To date, Lerner's invention has sold more than 100 million potato heads in over 30 countries. Sadly, George wasn't around long enough to see his invention become more popular than ever, thanks to a little animated film called Toy Story. And in 2021, Hasbro embraced Mr. Potato Head's gender fluidity and introduced just Potato Head. Here you go. You are what God made you. So I've got this hand, I've gone ahead and shaped, removed the cuticles, trimmed the nails. Um, I am going to do the same thing on this side, remove the cuticle, and then I'm going to buff them and get one step closer to application. Taking off all of the dead skin only. Any flyaway cuticles. The Pop Rocks urban legend almost killed the brand forever. Every near death story needs to begin. This one begins in Terrytown, New York, the home to General Foods and food chemist William Mitchell. He created a carbonated crystal that combines sugar, lactose, and corn syrup, which is basically sugar, sugar, and sugar. What kid would love that? His idea was you would add the crystals to water and they would form a fruit-flavored fizzy beverage. <coughs> End of story? Not quite. The problem with Mitchell's unflavored prototype is that the crystals didn't carbonate the drinks. There was no fizz. Yeah, it didn't quite work out as planned. When the crystals went into water, they did not carbonate the water. So Mitchell's invention sat on the shelf for a couple of decades. After some time on the shelf, Mitchell went back to his invention. He put the crystals in his mouth without water, and his mouth was closed. It seems that those crystals that didn't carbonate in cold liquid exploded when they came in contact with the saliva in someone's mouth. That's because our saliva is about 89 degrees, and the crystals in the formula reacted with the warmth of the spit. If you look closely at the crystals under a microscope, there are tiny bubbles, each containing carbon dioxide gas under high pressure. If the crystals were to come in contact with your mouth, the 600 psi bubbles of gas would be released with a... Explosion was memorable. Oh, 
it's as bad as I remember. Where the name Pop Rocks came from is unknown. But what is known is that Mitchell convinced the folks at General Foods that it could become its own okay. In 1975, it finally hit the market. Pop Rock, revolutionized the confectionery industry when they sold 500 million packets in just 18 months, making it the best selling candy ever. Pop Rocks was riding high until the Mikey incident. So there are rumors all over the place. That Mikey, the kid from the Life cereal commercial, had died eating Pop Rocks mixed with soda. And people were actually believing this. So with this explosive rumor about people buying, General Foods went on the offensive. They took out full-page ads and publications across America. They even went so far as to send the inventor, William Mitchell, across the country to give public talks. He went on like a whistle-stop tour of Pop Rocks. He went around telling kids, it's okay for you to put this silly little sugar exploding device in your mouth. But the damage had been done. Hot Rock sales plummeted and in 1983, the candy was pulled from ships. But the moratorium on Pop Rocks didn't last long. Two years later, General Foods sold the license and distribution rights to a Spanish company that continues to sell Pop Rocks today. As for William Mitchell, his story has a happy ending. This prolific food chemist went on to invent products like Tang, Cool Whip, and Instant Jello, all of which were probably used together in a terrible dessert from the 1960s. As for the dude who played Mikey, John Gilchrist left the business and is now a director of sales for a large company. It's unknown if he still eats live cereal or ever really enjoyed Pop Rocks. Pop Rocks. It's actually a sad story. We know now that the face of my cereal, this adorable little child, made the horrible mistake of taking pop rocks and washing them down with soda, and he literally shot live cereal out of his This is my nail prep. With a dry manicure. Of the size that it is today, and there were only 19 kernels per cup. Over the years, through genetic engineering, the corn on the cup became super sized. But there's always been a problem with corn. How are you supposed to eat something that's 220 degrees? Hot and super messy. So, to solve these corn eating conundrums, the corn cob holder was born. The journey of the corn cob holder has become a battle of inventor one-upsmanship. It's lasted decades. Little photographic documentation exists of those who invented these little nubs, but we've solved that issue. The earliest patent dates back to 1877, when Franklin M. Dixon created a device for holding the corn on the cob for posh people who couldn't possibly get their hands dirty. It was a single ornate spear with two tiny little pins on the side, so small that they barely pierced the cob to hold it in place. They were called table forks for green corn. This is a horrible design. Where was Elon Musk for this? Okay. Records, baby. You gotta control our rotational forces. This is this is this is nonsense. Now that's not good. Now that's not good. I'm just using these. Oh no, <laughs> my bonnet. <laughs> So what you really needed here was another pen. And that's when someone else came along with a better idea. One small adjustment would be a game changer when an inventor would lose one of the useless little pins and make the other one longer. In 1896, it was Charles Stebbins who created a two -pump. All right, now that I've gone ahead and shaped and removed all of my cuticles, I'm going to go ahead and buff. You can also take and you know, I, I, you can use this McCart buffer. It's a very light. I also like to use this buffer here has a rougher side so if you have any like skins that you feel like you want to kind of buff off but I don't so I'm just going to go ahead and do a light buffing and 
suspension on its heels. Since the two spheres were working just fine, he flipped the grip. Enter James Doherty Jr. Once you start doing this, you really don't want to touch your nail plate at all. perfectly clean, no flyaway cuticle. How to prevent any lifting completely. The first easy thing? Oh my gosh. I'm afraid and, and I'm excited at the same time. It brings back so many memories. This is awesome. Wow. Wow. Oh, oh, oh my dream. My dream is finally coming true. Uh, it gets pushed through with this hot light bulb. Its construction is not fantastic, but it does the trick. We'll get to the problem with mixing plastic and searing heat in a minute. But first, let's meet the guy who thought that was a good idea. Ronald Howes was a Depression-era kid who grew up in Cincinnati, helping his family run their small grocery store. And it was there that he observed people's special relationship with food. Ronald went off to fight World War II and then he returned, he went to college, and then he came back and started working at a local startup toy company called Kenner. He eventually landed the role of director of research and new product development. A colleague had returned from the All right, the same York thing with here. House. You just want to. Street vendors and restaurant tours kept their food warm by using light bulbs. So he started drawing up plans for a device that would let young children bake real food. He figured out that two 100 watt light bulbs in a small chamber could heat up the area to 350 degrees. Boiling water and hot light bulbs are really what kids are all about. By the way, we had time that he mixed up that terrible paste, and it was in the shape of a Mayan calendar. His slide became into a heating chamber, and 20 minutes later, a tiny little sponge cake would effortlessly slide out the other side. Like well focused because I can't tell. Oh, no. It's just revolting. Kings are cash. I shall never forgive you. So in 1963, Kenner released the Easy Bake Oven. Easy Bake, Easy Bake. Take all the dust. The Easy Bake Oven cost fifteen ninety five, which in today's dollars would be about hundred fifty dollars. In his first year alone, Kenner's 
And now I, I, this is where I'm really sure not to touch the top of my fingernails with everything. And, I'm, and I've already prepped my nails. This is another reason why I'm glad I've already prepped my nails. And I'm going to start with my bonder and primer and begin my Gel X application. In my my bonder and my primer is next. You want to keep this away from your light, people. While fresh in California vineyards lay claim to some of the world's finest. I use the same brush that came with the original kit. But you can use a different brush if you like. And now we're gonna go ahead and Put our primer, and I try to make sure I really don't touch the skin. So now that I have the primer, I'm going to go ahead and start to put the product. Turn on my curing lamp. Move this over here. Certain plastics are toxic to humans, and when they heat, they can leach out into the water. Box wine is in a box, but inside the box is a bladder. I don't want to drink anything out of the bladder. Luckily, that same year, the polyethylene bag was invented. It was a lot stronger and lighter. And it's also great for storing wine because it's corrosion resistant and it holds very low moisture. And so, Kobe had perfected his box wine and Here we go. Well, not quite. Unfortunately, the plastic filter spout had yet to be invented. So the early prototypes of boxed wine had to be sealed with a cork. So you grab the nail. Cork in the bladder. No. Bye. Grab your product. This is it. This must be what it is. Like to get it back, all right. And you put it on there, making sure there's no bubbles and making sure to get all at the bottom. And then I kind of just do the scrape so that I can scoop up the rest of the product. But about a year into his design, a new challenge materialized. If you feel like you need a little bit more product, grab it. And then I grab my nail right here. I make sure that all of the stuff is on there. Blush, 
popped wine leaves a smaller carbon footprint than a glass bottle. And after it's open, it can sit in your fridge for like four weeks before it spoils. It's the shape. You can stack them, you can pack them, you cannot do that with bottles. So, it's a wonder that three out of ten of those bottles in America come in a box. And you want to just make sure that you really just kind of lay it on top of the nail bed. And I like to put my handy dandy glasses on, making sure there's no bubbles. Just kind of lay it on top, close to the cuticle, and let it fill in. See, I don't like how it already kind of filled with some bubbles. So if you feel like that's the case, you can literally take some more. If you've got wealth of hilarious material that you're holding out on me, then you just give it to me right now. Because I don't really have much with rubber chickens. A common sentiment. And yet, the rubber chicken has clucked its way into the caverns of comedy for centuries. Rubber chicken, a lot of people don't know, it was invented by uh, Caratop's great-great-grandfather, Sir Parsnip Bottom. Back in medieval times, in the royal court, you would always have the funny way. Their sole function was to entertain everybody. These were dark days, and the kings needed levity. Because chickens were in such abundance, their corpses were readily available and could be used to make the king laugh. At some point, a desperate court jester, running out of material, went into a kitchen, grabbed a chicken, came out, and got an instant laugh. The crazy thing is, if they would cross a line, which they often did, they'd get whipped. The king was like Twitter, and if the king wanted to cancel you, you would die. You think the king will think we're funny? <laughs> Me neither. This Ooh, is the 16th century, and while some jokes kill, ah, just bring the shit out of myself. Oh my god! Wow. Okay. That is hot. Be careful with your lamp, people. Don't get too close. You can kind of feel the bottom of the nail. I'm gonna have to literally edit that part out. <laughs> I can't let them see that I burn myself. <laughs> this lamp is strong. It's my first time ever using it. It's my flash care lamp. It's strong as hell. I was like, this and. So yeah, that is my. Huh? This, this silver one. Okay, so that's my first one on. I don't know the research behind these curing lamps, people. And I'm going to go ahead and put my next one on. Grab a good amount of Shauna Danger, the high priestess of rubber chicken. Can I make this dress? Madam Priestess lives in Seattle, Washington, and is the curator of Archie McPhee. This is the world's premier rubber chicken museum. We don't really know the reason that it's the actual symbol for comedy and humor. But we know that every time somebody pulls out a rubber chicken, it's a hilarious moment. Chickens don't make that noise. What was this mated with? And so, while the life cycle of this funny little bird lives on, the rubber chicken continues to create dissension, apathy, and conflict in the comedy world. Why did the chicken cross the road? Because I was going to stab it. Can I keep these? I have a show tomorrow. Yes, yes, yes. A lot of people have it. Bad breath means no kissing. 
we can't evolve as a species with bad breath. It's always the close talkers who seem to have the bad breath. But anytime someone offers you a stick of gum, take it. You're being polite. Bad breath is big business, with mouthwash sales spitting out nearly half a billion dollars annually. Just about every culture has had its own approach to mouth hygiene, from the ancient Romans to the Aztecs to the Native Americans. Everything from false daisy to lotus root to wild ginger has been used to keep your mouth set free. I think everything was a little stinkier 2,000 years ago. In the 18th century, scientists discovered that human beings have all kinds of living organisms running rampant in their mouths. When you wake up, your mouth, with its billions of bacteria, can be the dirtiest part of your entire body. And today, if you've got minty fresh breath, there's a guy named Dr. Joseph Lister you should thank. Dr. Joseph Lister was a British surgeon in the mid-1800s. At one point, Dr. Lister noticed that raw sewage treated with carbolic acid didn't smell so bad. Maybe that carbolic acid was destroying the odor-causing bacteria, the same types of bacteria that cause infection and wounds. And maybe Dr. Lister could use that same chemical as an antiseptic. As it turns out, Dr. Lister was right. Carbolic acid was great at killing bacteria, but also pretty good at killing people. It would burn her own skin if applied in too great a quantity, and if you breathed it in or swallowed it, it could destroy your esophageal lining, your eyes, other important areas, and pretty important proteins. Once you've gone ahead and done a flash cure and put them on on, you can go ahead and cure them all underneath the lamp for like 60 seconds just to make sure that they're all on there. And there you go. They are on. 
fence the skulls of small animals. And I'm going to do the other hand, and I'm going to go ahead and put some primer on this side, since I hadn't done that before, because I like to wait a little bit until I'm almost getting ready to put them on. But they needed a way to deter them. Holy... Who? If I was to Google it, that's what it would say. Holy water. But how? The vending machine had a slot for a gold coin on the top of the device. Once inserted, so the coin go. on a scale. Its weight raised a lever, which opened a stopper, releasing a tiny amount of holy water before the coin falls off and the stopper comes back down. How am I to notice that? I've never been in church in my life. Now, let's fast forward to the Industrial Revolution. Chris Weber popularized the first modern coin-operated vending machines in England. In 1883, he invented a machine to distribute postcards for a penny. By 1888, there were at least 7,000 vending machines located in railway stations across the UK. Around the same time, Thomas Adams is in New York City trying to come up with an idea to hawk his invention. Tutti Frutti Chewing Gum. Oh, Tutti Frutti Gum. Was the first gum? Tutti Frutti, huh? In 1888. No, no, my favorite flavor. He leans on what the Europeans came up with, the machine. Adam's design stacked small squares of gum, and after a coin was deposited, the customer could push the gum into a slot. By the 1930s, vending machines were popping up faster than bottle caps. Ignited by the original soda machine. The original machine had a bottle-filled carousel built under the machine's red top. A customer would place a coin in the slot and push forward, unlocking a handle on the top of the machine. A turn of the handle would rotate a disc with two offset circles, revealing a bottle filled carousel underneath. If you do get some seepage on the sides the of the nail, you don't want to scrape or peel it up. You want to cut it off after the nail has cured your nippers now, like so. In the 1950s, people were afraid to fly, so they had vending machines with life insurance policies in them right in the airport. The last thing you want to see when you board a plane. But it's no surprise that eventually people found a way to beat the vending machine system. As is often the case, customers figured out a workaround and used slugs instead of coins. The machines couldn't tell the difference between real coins and objects of the same size made from metal, wood, even ice. Laws were passed to prohibit the manufacturing of objects that mimicked coins. Eventually, the technology improved to reject these counterfeits. In fact, today, a machine can tell the difference between ink on a real bill versus counterfeit currency. The vending machine has proven to be a resilient marvel, unafraid to change with the times. In fact, in certain states, you can buy marijuana from a vending machine, but that's nothing compared to other countries. Pop quiz. Which of the following vending machines exist? A live crab vending machine in China. Gold to go in Dubai. Or dirty underwear in Japan. I'm going to go with the crab. So I'm going to say gold to go in Dubai. A gold to go vending machine. I know that uh, dirty underwear is a big thing in Japan. No judgment. Good for you guys. The crab one? The correct answer is you're all right. Oh, oh my god, they all do it. It is. Oh my god. Yeah. Who doesn't want to buy a crab? They're delicious. I mean, it's just to take it's to getting them home, I think, once you get it out of the machine. We are so boring in America. Why can't we step up our vending machines? Why can't we put something interesting? What, like they've used underwear? Well, it's not my thing, but it's somebody's. I just realized that one wasn't the right size, so I'm just going to go to the next nail. Welcome to the happiest place on earth. Oh, that was good. 
I got the nails on, except make it out when I got one more. So here's what went in a horrible concoction of chemicals, I assume. Synthetic resin, polyisoprene. This is what size. Plasticizer, dibutyl phthalate, sorbitol trioliate surfactant, silicon fluid, and dimethyl siloxane. Right. That was my next guess. I was going to say that. The material was pretty thick, so they tried between 30 and 40 different types of spray nozzles. But none of them worked. Finally, the chemist tried one remaining spigot. That nozzle created a stunning, hyper thin rope of goo. It placed the mixture in a can, then injected it with the best air. When the cap is pressed, the chemicals are shot into the nozzle where they mix and react. I shaped it and it has to go from the sidewall to sidewall without adding any extra pressure and it has to fit naturally and then you can go ahead and you know take your electric file just to go ahead and prep the nail so that it can have a rougher surface creating some grooves and taking off the shine from the inside This I'm about to show you what they all look like on. It's supposed to be extra short, but I feel like they're not too far from the short size of the original Gel X system. So, um, I don't know. They're still kind of long on me, which I know is some silly because, but I'm doing nails on people, so I don't want like really super long nails. But I still love them. I love the way they look, and. This is what they look like on nice. my fingers so far. And then now the next part is to still shape them. Even though they're not acrylic, you still have to kind of mold them, shape them, make sure that you get any seepage that came out 
which shouldn't be a lot, that your goal is to not ever have any seepage to avoid lifting, and then get in them buffed and ready to paint. Be right back. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and use the A-Press nail file to go ahead and they have a 100 grit on one side, 180 on the other, and they have a flat. So just to kind of shape. Since I'm done with my flash cure lamp, I'm gonna go ahead and move it over here. And bring my other lamp closer to help me with all that. you clean your tools the people goes back Put them but actually <laughs> I need that sorry I'm gonna be taking any overage that came off no there wasn't really any overage on this side what you do is you kind of follow the nail growth line and you can kind of just mold this This product is really, this is a soft gel tip, so you, you, you can over file it, so you just want to be careful not to do that. Do you want me to do your manicure and paint one of your, like paint your pinky or paint your nails? Elliot? Do you want me to do your manicure and paint your nails? I can paint the pinky black. Alright, when I'm done with mine. Um, tablet domain. Five four seven. Thank you. 
hockey, and they're still hand-making each ball. And they've created specialized super-sized balls for the likes of Madonna and Garth Brooks. Well, these in my bedroom. This could be like Party Death Star. Don't think I may have won that one film. Once it's called The Empire Returns and Strikes Me Again once more, but what if the star that it looked like this? Who's blowing this up? If I'm looking, I'm like, steer clear, this thing's beautiful. <laughs> lightly buff again so I'm gonna go ahead and just take my brush and clean it off and this is a light buff just to take off with the shine you're not, you're not going heavy here if you go heavy you're gonna create lines and that is gonna mess up your paint so literally it's so light just a little tickle 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 whisk 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 Forcey moved on to building the bear. I mean, Billy. For starters, he had to minimize the animatronics to fit into the toy. It took Forcey about two years to get Teddy to work. He planted a microchip in the Iliop's head that would give him the ability to show expressions. The chip was synchronized with an audio cassette that was embedded in his back. Oh my god. Uh, what? Don't you make mixtapes on these? Use them and try to get back your girlfriend. A simple stereo cassette that had two tracks and served multiple functions. One of the tracks contained Teddy's pre tape voice, and the other sent electronic signals to the microchip that's in his brain. The result was the world's first emotion bearing buddy. But on this deck came in price. This is uh, disturbingly heavy. This is heavy, you can rob a bank with this. You need to go on a diet, or you need to, like, work out. This guy runs on four C batteries. You could power a small country with this. Teddy was pretty bulky and weighed close to four pounds, which is equivalent to five cans of soup. But for the time, the technology inside was magnificent. The inventor licensed the rights to a brand new toy distributor and manufacturer, Worlds of Wonder, and Teddy Ruxpin was ready for launch. By the fall of 1985, Teddy Ruxpin was on store shelves and was a breakout hit. It sold more than 41,000 units in just the first 30 days. This despite the astronomical price tag then of $69.99. It takes like this about $180. And then toss in the upcharge of $12.95 for 60 additional tapes. And the Teddy package, it didn't come cheap. But only days after the holiday rush, the Teddy machine came to a screeching halt. 
35,000 Iliops were returned due to faulty tape players. And Worlds of Wonder responded with a public announcement, claiming that some teddies were sent to the Grundo Hospital to convalesce. All right, so now that I buffed, I'm literally ready to paint. I'm excited. Be right back with you to come back with my paint.